It's nearly 20 years now I've been a media lawyer and back in the day that meant dealing with the old fashioned press, the newspapers, and that's still something that, that goes on. But uh, was it 2003, four that Facebook launched and social media expanded? Um, and dealing with social media and the issues that come around it has become a huge part of what I do. Um, I work a lot within sport, I've worked for many years for a number of top Premier League football clubs. Uh, and that involves going into clubs, talking to young players about how they use social media, but more than that, how they use their, their smartphone, how they communicate, um, and how they get ready for a career in professional sport. And it's a career where there's no hiding places whatsoever. Um, and the mental health issues that come from that is something that's become a huge academic interest for me. Um, because when I work for a football player where the sun on Sunday or the Sunday mirror has turned his life over, um, I'm acting as a lawyer, but I'm also acting as a friend to him and someone that's trying to drag him through the, the mental health pressures that come from that. So, you know, that's been my journey and that's where I am now. I, I've now got a separate firm that's not a law firm called B5 Consultancy. We work with a lot of clubs, we do education, but we do support and we help the, the boy. And when I say the boy, I mean from the 16 year old to the 26 year old international. Um, in how he copes with those pressures, how we try and stop those pressures, but also how we help him to recover from those situations, and her as well, of course. Everyone knows until it happens to them. Um, there are so many problems that can exist and problems that we haven't anticipated. And when we talk about social media and problems for sports people on social media, we think Twitter, Instagram, someone posts something stupid, it goes viral, it ends up in the newspapers. But when I think about social media, it is the way we communicate. Every single person uh, in this country or across the world uses social media. So that means WhatsApp, it means Snapchat, it means TikTok, it means Instagram, it means Twitter, it means iMessage, it means text messaging. It's the way we communicate. We are putting all of our lives online. So if you open up your iPhone, you can track what you've done, you can track what places you've been to. So it controls our lives. We allow it to control our lives. So therefore, we all need to get to grips with it. You take a step further from that and say, you are a player at a Premier League football club or a Women's Super League football club. There is an intensity there because people have always been fascinated by football players and people in the public eye and want to know what they're doing privately. So therefore, when you make mistakes as a football player, they are magnified because people are more interested in putting those in the public domain. Screenshot goes viral or ends up in a newspaper. So the problems that can come up are huge. But what then goes beyond that is we have to protect, for example, our security online. One of the big things that we've had to deal with are people having their accounts hacked. When you have your accounts hacked, and God forbid you've got some really private information and photographs on that, that can absolutely change your life. It can impact your mental health. And when you impact your mental health, you affect you as a person, you affect you as a football player. So you know, that's just a little journey through some of the things that can happen. They are huge and, and, and they happen all the time. I would say on average, I am contacted once a week by a football player who's had an account hacked. And I, I obviously can't name names, but I'll give you some examples about how that happened. Um, so I'll give you one. Um, a lad was contacted on WhatsApp by a WhatsApp account which had the Instagram profile as its profile picture. Uh, and it was a Turkish number. And for whatever reason, the lad got this message from Instagram saying, click on this link to reset your account because it's going to be closed down. And he believed it. He believed it was genuinely from Instagram. And he put his account details in when he clicked on this link. Now, ordinarily, that would mean that the, uh, the hacker, because it was a hacker, would have had access to his Instagram account. But luckily, he'd been sat in one of our education sessions, um, which meant that he turned on two-factor authentication on the account, which means the hacker needed an extra layer of security, which was actually a text message to the lad's number to get into the Instagram account. So that sounds like danger over all fine. But the problem is this lad, like so many people out there, used the same password on all his accounts, including his Yahoo email, which was the email that he used on his Instagram. So he's given these hackers his Yahoo email address and the password he uses on Instagram and Yahoo. So the hackers don't get into Instagram. What do they do? They get into his Yahoo. 
And what can they do on that? They got into his eBay account and they started making bids on stuff that they could then get sent to them in Turkey. Uh, they access his Amazon account. They access his Twitter account and reset that. They locked him out of his Twitter account. He couldn't get back in it. This was a Twitter account with a blue tick. They started sending direct messages to people that he'd been contacting on, on uh, Twitter, some of whom were female, some of whom were not his girlfriend. So you can imagine the situation this poor lad, he's about 21, 22 years of age, he's making his, his, uh, his way through the championship, he's having a good career in football, and all of a sudden his personal life flipped, absolutely flipped on its head. Um, and he's concerned, he's worried, he's not sleeping, and I don't need to tell anyone how that impacts you as a human being and then how that impacts you as a football player. Getting the right communication behaviours which work for you is, is important. So it's important for me that I say I don't want to dictate how a football player communicates. Um, but I can give from the benefit of my experience um, what I think good communications behaviours are. Um, one thing I think is really important, um, whether I'm talking to a top Premier League player or a 13 or 14 year old kid that's coming through an academy, it's important to get those behaviours right as soon as you possibly can. And the way that I set them out, it's about three things. It's about taking as few risks as possible. We have to take risks. We have to cross the road. We have to enjoy our lives. Um, but we try to minimise those risks. The second thing, this is one of the most important things I'll say to any young professional, is being respectful. When you look at the top pros, you look at the top pros at your club, do they have that running through them? And the answer to that is almost always yes at top Premier League or Women's Super League football clubs. They're respectful, they're professional, they treat people the, the way that they would like to be treated. And the same applies to the way you communicate online. And the other, the final thing is to be defensive. I don't want football players to be paranoid, but I want them to be careful about the private information they share, both publicly and actually on private communications. I want them to take security importantly in terms of acting uh, adding two-factor authentication to their accounts and making sure that, that their accounts are less likely to be hacked but i also want them to not give too much away about themselves you know um not putting themselves at risk by you know to use a football analogy just jumping two-footed into a relationship or an online communication and sharing too much information so being risk averse being respectful being defensive that is a great starting point and do that from a young age. If you're 13, think about what your 23-year-old version of yourself would think. Would he be happy that you're asking silly questions on Ask FM or doing silly TikTok dances or sharing you know, silly pictures of yourself that you shouldn't have been sharing? If the 23-year-old version of you thinks that's a bad idea, then the 13-year-old version of you shouldn't be doing that either. So there's a balance in your communication behaviours and you have to get what's right for you. Um, so from my point of view, you should be planning it out. And it's difficult when you're young uh, to plan out what's right and wrong. And it's important, I think, you should talk to people around you about what your public profile looks like, what you want your public profile to look like versus what you want to keep private. Um, it's a battle I have with a lot of first team players. I'm always trying to persuade them to keep information as private as possible. Not too many photographs of your home, which is a security risk. You don't have to tag your partner on absolutely everything. But you need to get that balance right and find what's right for you. And then you've got, you'll have a, a lot that you might want to say about your private feelings. So, for example, political things, helping child poverty. Um, great example re, uh, uh, recently on, on Black Lives Matter and some fantastic work done by football players. So it's about finding what that balance is right for you and plan it out properly. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a particular example, actually, and I won't name the player because I don't think it's fair to, to, to name the player on this one, but, but, but he did this particularly well. He was a young player. He played UEFA Youth League matches, and they played in Eastern Europe. He was a young uh, black player, and he was racially abused out there. Um, it was a very important political topic for him to deal with, and he wanted to deal with it in a really sensitive way. He didn't want to just rush onto Twitter um, and, and express, express his displeasure on it because he knew that there were some political sensitivities there. He didn't want to be tiring the whole of one Eastern European country with, with, with that brush, and rightly so. But he wanted to make a stand because it's an important stand to make. 
So he came back to England, he sat with the club and he sat with his agent. He says, how do I express this in a way that gets across, not to just young black and mixed race people, but to people of all generations, to people in that Eastern European country as well. And what they did is they set it out that, that, that he was able to create some video content and do a fantastic interview with a journalist where he expressed how it made him feel, why it has to stop, and why it's important we talk about it. And the respect he got from the way that he did it was fantastic. And it was, it was good for him, and it was good for his mental health. Now, that might not be right for everyone, but I think the reason I tell that anecdote is it's about not being knee-jerk. Because if you feel strongly about something and you publish it in 280 characters on Twitter and you get it wrong. Um, and football players are paid a lot of money because they're good at football. Not because they're brilliant at dealing with political issues or they're very articulate or they can make something concise in 280 characters and it looks brilliant. And that's fine. And some of you boys and girls are brilliant at that. But don't be afraid to get help and support. When you're a, a, a Premier League football club that will help and support, it doesn't have to be your agent or some wonderful marketing team. Just talk to a few lads around the club or talk to coaches or staff, the media department, social media department. What is your issue? You know, do you want to talk about homosexuality uh, in football, LGBT rights? Do you want to talk about Black Lives Matter? Do you want to talk about child poverty? And when you look at players like Marcus Rashford or Sadio Mane or some of these great humble figures we've got out there, the reason they got it right is because they're good men and they thought about the issues, but then they've taken some time to get some good advice and the way it's been presented has been wonderful. So for me, don't be knee-jerk, talk to people, get advice. One of the things that's really important for a football player to come to terms with is, um, is how other people see you. Um, and it's coming to terms with the fact that other people will regard you as different. So you are not a normal boy or girl or man or woman. Because you are associated with a top football club, that makes you in some way different and therefore you can be treated differently. And I'll give you an example on that. It was a conversation I had with a, a top Premier League player He'd been the victim of someone who tried to sell a story to a newspaper about him. And he said to me this, he said, why do people do this to people like me? And, and the best answer I could give was, people don't really see you as a normal human being because you're not in a way. And people see you as almost like a character from a soap opera. You appear up there on Sky Sports every day on the, on the ticker during Sky Sports News on the week and playing on the weekends and, and midweek games. Therefore, you're a character. And so therefore, it's almost like you're impervious. You can't feel any harm. So you can be attacked in the media or you can be attacked on social media. And there will be this assumption, he'll be okay. He earns 100, 200, 300 grand a week. Don't worry about him. I can abuse him. I can sell his private information. Now, none of that is right and fair. So you are in an industry, the football industry, that people will not treat you as fairly as they would treat their next door neighbor. Um, but you have to come to terms with the fact that that is what will happen. So then when we go back to my communication behaviours, you should be able to take more risks. You should be able to, if you're feeling a bit down, tell someone that you, they're, think, you think they're a bit of a plonker. You should be able to be a bit more open and a bit less defensive. But unfortunately, we have to create a little bit of a shield for you to protect yourself because you know that if you send a silly picture on Snapchat to someone and they know you play for that football club, screenshot ends up going viral, ends up being sent to a newspaper. So if you know people are capable of doing that, not everyone, but some people are, then you'll adopt those behaviours a bit sooner. One thing I'm really keen to get across is that 99% you know, of the world are good and will treat you well. You know, most people, because you are at a top football club, just want a selfie or just want a little bit of recognition. But there will be that one person that you shared a direct message conversation, slid into your DMs and you shouldn't have interacted with this person who takes a screenshot and then it goes viral. Um, then you become that footballer that, that, that made that mistake. It doesn't matter that 99% of your life has been you doing good things, charity work, playing football uh, well, working hard. You made that one mistake and that one mistake will follow you for your football career. It shouldn't define you. You mustn't allow it to define you. But these things do happen. That one person that lets you down is the one person that makes your life much more difficult.
It's really, really important from my point of view that um, it's not just about drawing up a strategy of how you communicate, so those good behaviours. It's also about drawing up a strategy about how you cope with social media and the mental health impacts of social media. Now, the reason I say that is um, there's a lot of people out there that will say, well, you can put social media to one side it's not the real world. Worry about the real world. Well, that's not actually true. Social media is the real world. It is a part of our, our real world. So just as if things go wrong off the pitch in your personal relationships, for example, that will impact your mental health. Therefore, it'll impact you as a human. Therefore, it'll impact your performance on the pitch. Exactly the same thing applies to your social media. So you need to work out some coping mechanisms about the way it works for you. So that might be technical things like, are you going to mute certain words? Are you going to set your Twitter account up in a certain way that you can't get replies? Or, uh, on Instagram, are you not going to allow replies? Or are you going to allow your agent or marketing uh, agency? Or you know, if you're a, a younger player with not that earning potential, are you going to let your brother or your sister or your mum or your dad take control for certain points? Are we not going to check it as soon as we get off the pitch and look at all of our mentions, whether we play well or whether we play good? Um, and that's an important point, by the way. Um, your career, doesn't matter where you are currently, sitting right in front of me, is going to go like that. It's going to go up, it's going to go down. When you look at the players, the legends out there, um, every single one of them has had low points in their career. And I always think of one, um, one good example. Uh, there would be Steven Gerrard, someone that won the Champions League, played 100 times for his country. One of the things that people think about with Steven is the slip against Chelsea, which is an extraordinary to think, thing to think about with a player that achieved that much. And it will have haunted him during, during the later parts of his career. He'll never be able to go back and correct that. Your career will have highs and lows. It doesn't matter what level you're at now. Um, and from my point of view, it's, it's important, particularly when it relates to social media, to treat the highs and the lows exactly the same. And what I mean by that is to discount them. Now, I actually had a very good conversation recently with a, a, an academy player, a young player who went through a top academy, played a few first team games, and now he's playing in the lower leagues. When he was at that high of playing a few first team games in the Premier League, he said to me, I drowned out the noise. Everyone was saying I'm the next this player, I'm the next that player. And it was important for me to not get too excited by that. My followers went up to 100,000, I was getting likes, I was getting retweets, but I tried to drown that out. And the reason I did is because I knew I might end up where I am now. And I'm playing in League One and I've had injuries and things have been bad. Someone even set up a Twitter account in this lad's name uh, criticising him for being constantly injured. And you can imagine the lows of that point. So it helped him to drown out the negatives because he'd already drowned out the positives. And for me, this is about an inner self-belief. There is nothing like a career in sport because someone doesn't come into my office and look over my shoulder when I'm drafting an email and look and say, that is a rubbish email, mate. You are useless. But that does happen in football. You will be judged time and time again. And the, the place you'll see that judgment the most is social media. Um, when people are saying you're brilliant, you need to be able to drown that out just as much as when people are saying you're terrible. If I can take that to an academy point of view, it's one thing I worry for young professionals. So if you sign a pro contract with a big Premier League club, you will become a very wealthy young man. Um, at that point, there is a danger to get caught up in, the, in what might be perceived as the footballer lifestyle. So sharing pictures of your Yeezys or Balenciagas or your expensive purchases, things that you know, the background you came from, you wouldn't have been able to afford that. And there's a bit of a danger of being, getting too caught up in that, in the likes and the retweets and the comments and the girls and the boys putting hearts on you and saying how great you look. If you allow yourself to get too caught up in that, you start committing yourself to a lifestyle that when you're playing in National League South in a few years' time, which could happen, still a good career, by the way, um, you might find yourself really feeling the lows because you enjoyed the highs too much. And I think if mentally you can balance out how you enjoy social media, then that's a good challenge. The other thing I want to say about social media and how you balance how it makes you feel is, um, for me, social media, it's a public forum for a football player. It's, about, it's an outlet. So it's about you doing work with a club 
work with sponsors when you're at that stage of your career, um, talking about charitable causes. It's about putting information out there. What I don't want it to be for young and older football players is an inlet. If you're going on social media because you want someone to say, wow, you're a sick footballer or whatever the, the people would say on social media, you're looking at the wrong places to find that. Your inner belief must be on you. I know I play well or I know I play badly or your coach or the people around you that really know you as a football player. If you're using social media as a grading point for how your career is going, you're looking in the wrong place. Because we know social media is full of fakes, you know, both people who act in a fake way or actual fakes, actual robots. So you're looking in the wrong place and you will get a confused perception of who you are as a football player. That is not healthy. Social media is an outlet, it's not an inlet. One thing that's important to know and understand when you play for a top football club is that people actually, they think you're almost a superhero. So, you know, you do superhuman things because you can play football at the top level. So people think you're wonderful for that. But also, they think you're a superhero. That means that they think that you can cope with anything. Um, they think you're an extraordinary individual. You get paid a lot of money or the perception is that you get paid a lot of money and therefore you'll be okay. Um, but the fact is, and I know that you know this looking at me, you are not an extraordinary human. You just have an extraordinary talent. You are an ordinary human with an extraordinary talent. So that means you need a really good support network around you. You need people around you telling you the truth and you need people around you who will love and support you for the human being that you are, not for the footballer that you are. So the people that will support you are not people that want you to advertise their cat brand for you on Instagram or all the people that like your posts on Instagram or all the people that want to engage with you on Snapchat. The people around you are the people that were there for you on day one. You know, you see this on, on social media a lot, people talking about, this is my day one brother or whatever else, the, the, the phrases that young people use. Those people that don't necessarily want the reflected glory of you, the football player, those people that care and love uh, you, the human being, not the football player, that's so important. So that means people, not just people who have got only a financial interest in you, that means people that, that, that care about you as a human being and not as a football player. And, and I always use the phrase hangers on. If the people that are around you are always asking you for favours, can you retweet this for us? Can you get me into this bar or this club? Can you get me a signed shirt from this player in the first team or whatever else? Um, yeah, of course, you might feel as though you owe some, some of your friends a little bit of a favour if they've supported you, but the people that really push that, that's the question you've got to ask yourself at that point. Um, find the people around you that will get you to the next stage. And that doesn't mean the people that want you to make all the money so that you can take them on expensive holidays or whatever else. That means the people that want to get you, the human being, to the point at which you want to get to in life. Well, I think in terms of what you should share and what you shouldn't share, I'd divide it into two forms of social media. So there's the first form, which I'd regard as, or guess what you might call private social media, or at least what people regard as private social media. So um, a lot of uh, young sportsmen and women regard, for example, Snapchat as a private social media. And the idea of the platform is that your photos, your messages disappear. And I think it's really important that when you're using private social media, um, for me, I would start adopting the behaviour if you're a football player that, um, everything you share has a very good chance of becoming public. You know, there are lots of screen sharing apps that allow people to download your snaps. Um, I know that because it's my job to deal with that and, I, and the amount of times I've seen newspapers publish private social media from Snapchat, etc. I've lost count. So you should treat your private social media as though it's likely to become public. And then you'll start adopting those good behaviours, being risk averse, respectful, and defensive you know if your snapchat story every day is something you wouldn't dream of putting on instagram then question yourself why are you doing it and that's for me really really important um and then you've got your public social media what do you want your public profile to be and how much private information do you want to share so as i've said it's an outlet it's about letting the general public know what you are about as an individual, what you want them to know. And there's a few things I'd say, you make your own choice and you might disagree with me on this, but I would say 
I worry sometimes, particularly young boys and girls who share um, their girlfriends or their boyfriends Instagram handle all the time, go away on a fancy holiday and tag their girlfriend on it. You know, that might be uh, that, that your girlfriend or your boyfriend might end up becoming your husband, your wife, your love of your life, you'll be with them forever. But imagine that relationship then falls down. You've then got to go, it's an awful thing to have to do, go through your Instagram account and delete all of those photographs and untag your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Or, you know, God forbid you make a mistake in your personal life. Someone goes on your Instagram account and then starts direct messaging your girlfriend and making hell with your private life. Um, from my point of view, you can rail back a little bit. You don't have to show your girlfriend or your boyfriend you love them by tagging them every five seconds on Instagram. Um, you also don't have to share pictures of your kids or your nieces, your nephews. Um, you might feel that that is the right opportunity for you to show what a family man or a family woman you are, and that's fine. But think about the implications as well. Everyone can see your Instagram, okay? And that means all the lovely people out there, but it also means the slightly unpleasant people out there as well. Just think about what the balance is for you. Find that balance. If you think I'm wrong, if you think all your private life should be on there, that's fine. But think about it before you reach that reason. Um, so for me, the, the thing to do is to work out, look, how is it you want to present yourself publicly? And I mean this if I'm talking to an established international compared to a 16-year-old kid. Um, how is it you want to present yourself publicly? And then try and stick to that plan. So for example, you might decide your Instagram account is you as a baller. So it's you about doing uh, deals with your boot sponsor, doing stuff about the club and doing new training. And you don't have anything personal on it. And that's an easy rule to follow. Or you might have something that's a bit more complicated. You know, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're a father or a mother and, and your child's very important to you and you don't mind sharing photos of your kid. I mean, it's, that's, that's not my approach, but it's okay if that's yours. So therefore, you'll pick and choose what works there. But for me, it's about being uniform with it and thinking about it. Because the danger is if you break your own rules, then you'll find things, that's when things go wrong. So I'll just give you an example of... Um, I had one player, a, a, a player that was using Instagram like, I'm a footballer, this is all my football stuff. But then got slightly drawn in with TikTok and started doing dances and sharing loads of images of his girlfriend and him messing around at home. And the view that he had is, well, TikTok, TikTok, and what goes on TikTok stays on TikTok. And didn't quite realise how easy it is for me to download those videos and then share them on Twitter and Instagram. And before you know it, you're searching for this player on Twitter and Instagram, and all you can find is him looking like a plonker on TikTok. Within the TikTok community, everyone knows how TikTok works, and it's not, not a problem to look like a plonker. And he couldn't distance his Instagram and his Twitter from his TikTok account, and he think, oh, I've got it all wrong. So find what works for you and then go for it. And, and, and I guess one practical measure that you can put in place is you might want to just enjoy looking at Instagram or looking at TikTok or whatever else. Well, it's fine to be anonymous on that. You know, I've got a client of mine, he's a top player, he's played over 100 times for his country and he has an Instagram account that's basically managed by his agent. It's all for sponsor work, it's all commercial um, and he doesn't give away much about his private life but he wants to interact with his friends. He wants to be a normal human being because that's what footballers are. So he's got an account, you wouldn't know it's him, a private account uh, which allows him to have direct messages with his friends, his friends know it's him. Um, and he can act like a normal citizen away in the shadows. And there, you know, his agent and his commercial deals can be completely separate for that. So it's good to have that separation. One thing I think is really important that we think about in terms of particularly public social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook to an extent, is um, different people have different views on everything. Um, if you are going to tackle a subject which is a sensitive subject, whether it be about racism, about poverty, about politics, you need to be 100% sure you know what you're talking about and you also know the consequences of talking about it. There's a really good example in the recent past where a, a club in the lower leagues, Port Vale, um, they were drawn in the League Cup to play Manchester City. Uh, one of their players, Tom Pope, had been pretty prolific on social media in the past. And one of his old tweets was to criticise the, the Man City defender, John Stones. I think he said something along the lines of, I'd love to play against Stones every week, I'd score lots of goals. So, of course, football fans love that kind of banter. It went viral. Port Vale play on Man City. They lost, but Pope scored. 
So of course that made people think it was wonderful. And all of a sudden, Tom Pope is a social media star. Everyone's piling on in a good way and he's enjoying it. Everyone wants to know Tom Pope's view on everything. And that's where it's dangerous because you know, Tom Pope is a talented football player. He's not some political analyst. So someone asked him about what's the future of the world. And you know, I won't repeat it, but he came up with this tweet and I am certain he didn't understand what he was posting. But what he posted was, um, uh, it was anti-Semitic, it was anti-Jewish. It was something that was bound to cause offence to Jewish people. And I, as I say, I'm certain that Tom didn't understand that, but he posted it. And as soon as he posted it, of course, he lost control of it. Complaints were made. It became a big media storm. Now, Tom, for his sins, a year before, got in an argument with someone on Twitter. So the FA had already banned him from one game for making a mistake on Twitter. After he posted this thing, which was offensive to Jewish people, he got a six-game ban. That is absolutely massive. The FA punished him because it was a second offence and it caused huge outrage to Jewish people. The impact on that, can you imagine walking into your coach's office and saying, yeah, this is a bit awkward. I'm not gonna be able to play for over a month because of something I posted on social media. So what does that mean in terms of tips? Well, what that means is political issues, issues, social issues, they need to be dealt with with sensitivity. One, because it's good not to upset people, but two, for self-preservation as well. If you get it wrong, if you make a mistake, as I said, I genuinely believe that Tom Pope made a mistake. If you make a mistake, the consequences, in terms of real consequences on the pitch, receiving a ban, but we'll go back to what I've said about mental health. I don't know Tom Pope, I don't know how he responded to it, but I can tell you, having dealt with a lot of players in the public eye, when it goes wrong, it's heartbreaking. I'm talking about big, tough guys in tears on the phone because things have gone wrong in the normal media or on social media. Um, and one other thing I can say, I mean, this is going back to, to mental health, but when it goes wrong, I, I once received a message from a player where it was going wrong on the media. And his message to me was, I just want to disappear. And that is, that's, that's a very powerful and upsetting message to, to feel like you need to send. Just because you're a football player, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt you when you get it wrong. And I guess that's what we want to guard against, is making those kind of mistakes that put you in that hurt zone. And when you, when you get it wrong, when, to use a phrase, when the pelters come in, when you are being absolutely hammered on Twitter, on Instagram, you enter, I'd call it hurt zone. You know, you are feeling it. Your mental health is under massive pressure. That pressure transcends to you as a human being and then transcends to you as a football player. Um, I have had situations where players have been under the cosh because either they've made a mistake or they've got it wrong, both on social media and in their private lives. And stepping on the pitch becomes a problem. And of course, if you don't step on the pitch when you're in a media storm, that adds to the media storm because player makes mistake on social media or player makes mistake in the media, doesn't play, we've got more headlines and more things going viral. So it can become a little circle of hurt and that genuinely impacts your football career. And that's what we're trying to get you, you to avoid. Humility is a massive lesson for all young footballers and, and even older footballers to learn from my point of view at the best of times. Um, I see far too much of players exploiting wealth, um, but we've had a bit of a change actually. Society changed in 2020 when we had the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and we saw a move towards, well, I guess, the Rashfords, and there's loads of players that have done great work in terms of giving back to communities. And I do feel as though we're moving away from what I'd call the Zlatan effect, with all due respect to that wonderful football player, this idea of saying, I am Zlatan, I am God, doesn't seem to be an aspiration as much anymore, because we see the way that young lads like Marcus Rashford have behaved, and the way the public have behaved to that in these difficult times. For me, that's the aspiration. Not your fancy boots, not your flash cars, not your, I was here and now I'm really wealthy. We don't want to see that from football players. The public don't want to see that. The people that you've supposedly left behind who have not got that money don't want to see your wealth. They want to see your humility. And when we have situations where, well, Black Lives Matter is fighting back against inequality, when we see COVID-19, people losing jobs, people losing loved ones, people worried about getting ill, 
We really don't want to see footballers and their wealth. We want to see footballers working hard and giving back. And I know from working within the game how hard footballers work and how much they give back. And we want to see that. We don't want to see necessarily overshouting it, being too pleased with yourself, patting yourself on the back. But we do want to see that footballers are socially responsible. And there was a moment in 2020 at the beginning of the crisis where the government said footballers should do more. And then as the crisis went on, the public started to see politicians aren't doing enough. Footballers are doing their fair share. And that made my heart swell from working with young footballers who come from tough backgrounds and give back. And for me, that was really aspirational for all football players. Um, be like your peers, be like these brilliant footballers who have given so much, to their, so much back to their community. From my point of view, the core behaviours, there's, there, there's three. Risk averse, respectful, defensive. If we look at being risk averse, what does that mean? Um, well, look, we have to take risks in our life. I always use this example, we have to cross the road. But also we have to use social media. Um, it's very difficult to drop out of society and that's what it would mean to not use social media. But what being risk averse means is not getting into situations which are, which are too risky and are not worth the risk taking. So I would always think of, for example, people sliding into your direct messages. When someone slides into your DMs, who are they? What do they want? And what do they want to achieve for themselves? Because they're not there to help you. They might be there to try and get you to advertise their brand. They might be there to try and persuade you to share information about yourself that you shouldn't share so that they can post it on social media or whatever else. They might be a hacker, a blackmailer. There is a lot of criminality on the internet and that, a lot of that comes through Instagram and Snapchat. And if you are a football player, you are more likely to have someone slide into your DMs than you're a normal member of the public. It's a simple fact of life. That might be fun, but as long as you are thinking, what are the risks here? What am I risking? How badly could this go wrong? How will it affect my reputation? How will it affect my mental health? And if you think that every time someone contacts you, then you'll take a hell of a lot less risks and you're less likely to need someone like me or the support of the club or the support of your agent because it's less likely to go wrong. In terms of being respectful, um, of my three behaviours, um, I believe this is the most important. Uh, when I think about the top professionals I've worked with in all sports and both men's and women's sports, I think of people who are professional, uh, act in a way which is kind. They think about the people that they deal with on a daily basis and they treat those people in a way that they would want to be treated. And I think of top professional football players, the, the people that I really admire, they are the people that when they walk into a hotel and they go to check in, they talk to the person at check in, they ask them how they are. Um, and the amount of times when you do that, it blows the person away. And they will walk through the rest of their day saying, this player from this football club came in, wow, he or she was so nice and what a great uh, impact that had on me. Now, the reason to be respectful is because it's a good thing to do, but also because it helps you. So if you use WhatsApp in a respectful way, if you are not hammering everyone or being rude to people or sharing photographs of people that they didn't want to be shared, if you are being respectful, if you are saying thank you, to a, play, a, a member of staff at the club that's helped you or someone in the agency that you work with that's helped you out, um, you're setting yourself on the right path because you are leaving people with a glow about the way that you, uh, you behave. And they will tell anyone that, that will listen, oh, I had, to, I had to help out this player the other day. What a nice person that person was. And that makes a massive positive impact on your career. But also, if you flip that on its head, what if you are a plonker? What if you are disrespectful? At what point is someone going to say enough's enough, screenshot, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, or try and blackmail you, or go to a newspaper? If you are a bad person, I genuinely believe this, you will give yourself a much worse chance of succeeding in professional football. I genuinely believe the men and women at the top of the game in football, the vast majority of them are good human beings, and that's why they are there.
And, to, and then the final one is being defensive. And what I mean by that is um, you don't need to block out every, every person that might come into your life, but you need to be putting some protections in front of you and in front of those around you as well. So what that means, like very practical things like making sure you've got the best security on your social media and on your emails. And please go away and Google two-factor authentication on your Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, because there are plenty of hackers out there that want to get into your accounts. That's an important thing. But also it's about not oversharing information, oversharing photographs. You might have started uh, an early relationship with someone and that someone wants lots of pictures of you. Of course they want lots of pictures of you because you're the love of their life. You're also a football player as well. And that person might want all those pictures because they want to tell all their mates that they're dating a football player. And think, if you give away too much, and God forbid you're giving away naked photographs, which I think is the biggest mistake. It doesn't matter whether you're a kid or a grown-up. For me, if I could talk any footballer out of naked selfies, I would have done a really, really good job. For me, that's what about being defensive is. Thinking, if I give too much away, how vulnerable do I make myself? I think one, one thing that's particularly important is if things go wrong online, get help immediately. Um, nothing is irredeemable. If something goes wrong online, it will not be the end of your life or your career. So it's really important that you don't think things are catastrophic. Get help as soon as you can. Talk to people. Um, you might think something's really minor, but if it's troubling you, talk to people. Um, you're within a football club where the support you get is fantastic. So develop those relationships early on so you've got people to talk to. And then when something's going wrong or you're worried about something or you think something could go wrong in the future, talk to people, get help, get support. Um, and one thing I really want to say is nothing is irredeemable. Um, something you, you might watch this video and then in the future you might make one of the exact mistakes that I talk about. And I tell you, you would have no judgment from me if that does happen. Human beings make mistakes all the time and it doesn't end the world, okay? It's so important that you allow yourself to, for to forgive yourself and to move on. And you also don't define yourself by the mistakes that you make. So you might make a decent sized mistake in your career. It might cause you huge heartache. It might damage your reputation. It might hang around on your Wikipedia page forever. And that's horrible and it's difficult to come to terms with. But the most important part of it will be the recovery. This, uh, you saying to yourself, I will not define myself by that mistake that I made. I worked hard, I was a good person, and the people that know me, know me, know what a good person I am. And that is what defines me, how hard I worked, what a good person I was, not that mistake. Mm -hmm.